Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones. The election is almost upon us and here to answer your questions tonight, the leader of the Greens, Richard Di Natale, Deputy Opposition Leader and Shadow Education Minister, Tanya Plibersek. Liberal Party campaign spokesman and trade minister Simon Birmingham and independent candidate for Indi, Helen Haynes. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, this time next week, the votes will be cast and counted, so this is your last chance to quiz our political leaders on this program. Our first question comes from Philippa Cole. Yesterday's announcement by the Liberal Party, endorsed by the Labor Party also, indicates that the government will guarantee about 15% of the 20% deposit a first home buyer would normally pay. While this policy is finally, attempt, finally an attempt from the government to address concerns about the cost of buying a first home, it does mean young people may be borrowing up to 95% of the value of a property. My question is, does this policy encourage the irresponsible lending practices that led to the Banking Royal Commission? Simon Birmingham. No, it does not, because in the end, the same prudential tests will exist. So banks will have to make sure that people have the capacity to repay, have the proving, proven income and savings track record to be repay, to repay. What this policy is all about, though, is acknowledging that, say, if you're looking at buying, for easy maths, a $500,000 home, a 20% deposit is $100,000 that you have to save. And that, of course, is a big task. And if the home's more expensive, then it's an even bigger task. And we acknowledge that can take years and it's a struggle while you're paying rent and paying other costs along the way. So will you so explain to... for us what the government's role would be here? Because you're obviously not going to put up the ballots of the $75,000. They'll still have to come up with that. Um, so what will the government... What The $500,000 you're talking about, Correct. what will it be spent on? So, so a government fi financing agency will enter into contra contracts with banking institutions, particularly prioritising small banks to drive a bit more competition in the banking sector first. They enter into contracts with banking institutions for an agreement that a bank who does a thorough assessment of an individual's ability to repay that loan uh, can then get a government guarantee for the gap between the 5% and the 20%. It's only a guarantee. We're not handing the money over. And so in the end, the homeowner still pays Why do you need the, the money if you're not handing any money over? What's the $500 million for? Uh, to make sure that we're prudently budgeting so that you're capitalising that government financing agency to deal with any costs that it incurs along the way. In so, the you're end, effectively, the government will be a mortgage insurer, is that what you're saying? Essentially, Tony, that's right. And so it's about making sure, though, that rather than young people having to spend years extra paying rent and trying to still save, they're able to get that first rung on the ladder of owning a home, they're able to then start paying their mortgage rather than paying rent, and build equity in their property. And it sits alongside other things that we've done as a government, such as the utilisation of superannuation accounts, where we have put in place tax cuts, essentially, for young people to be able to save that home deposit by using the superannuation vehicle to do so. Uh, now, the Labor Party proposed to eliminate that, and that's a $400 million cost to uh, young home savers over the next four years. Let's just let's to stick to uh, the policy we're talking about. So, mm -hmm. what happens if the loan goes bad? Is the government up for the four hundred and seventy-five thousand that was borrowed by these people? No, the government's role is uh, is in providing mortgage insurance support there, and particularly. So, if the loan goes the bad, insurers have to come up with the balance that's still after the property's sold. The balance is left, so there's risk for the government, is there not? There is an element of risk for the government. If there wasn't, it wouldn't be necessary uh, for government to step into the space at all. Uh, okay. But we think it's a prudent risk because in the end, the same standards apply that banks are currently applying in terms of analysing the income, the spending, the saving habits, uh, and of course, the value of the property that somebody's purchasing. It's just about bringing forward that transaction potentially by years, which can make a huge difference okay. for a young Our person. Our next question on the same subject comes from Martin Beatty. Um, I'd like to ask um, the, Tanya what, why the Labor Party was so quick to jump on this policy and potentially um, put a whole generation of first home buyers into negative equity if the housing market continues on its current slide. Mm. Well, we were happy to match the policy because we, if, if the government has a good idea, we're happy to cooperate with them uh, and match the policy. But the 
bigger question of the fact that first home buyers have been locked out of the housing market for a long time. Uh, that's been going for years and it's sad that just six days out from an election after six years of inaction on first home buyers' struggles, uh, this government thinks they're going to, um, to, you know, pull the wool over people's eyes and say that they've fixed the problem. Uh, we think that um, the first time saver accounts that the government got rid of that we had were a great contribution to help people save a deposit for their first home. The Housing Supply Council was making a critical difference to housing policy. And most importantly, our policies on negative gearing uh, that would level the playing field between first home buyers and investors buying their sixth or tenth or thirtieth property are a really important contribution. So far from this government, we had Joe Hockey say, get a better job. We had Malcolm Turnbull say, get rich parents. And now, six days out from an election, Scott Morrison says, oh, the, I've got all the answers uh, with this new scheme. We think it's a modest contribution, but and we're happy to match it because it's a modest contribution. But the bigger problem of locking first home buyers out of the market, uh, it's a uh, you know, it's not save, solved by this policy. Uh, on just side. a quick follow-up on this policy. Doesn't it sound just a little bit like the situation in the United States, where an awful lot of low-income mm. people were given big loans uh, for houses they couldn't afford, and this helped trigger the GFC? Mm. Look, I think uh, people have to be very careful in any debt that they're taking on, and I think lending institutions have to be very careful in any debt that they allow people to take on. Uh, many people have observed that since the Banking Royal Commission, it has been hard to get finance uh, for, uh, for some people entering the first home market. So uh, we need to take uh, a broad approach that deals with the tax concessions that Scott Morrison said in 2016, negative gearing um, was, uh, um, uh, was being overused in some circumstances. We see from an FOI leak today that he himself wanted to look at negative gearing as a as a, a, a problem in the housing market. He's not prepared to look at a policy that Labor's proposed. We don't want to be pig-headed and ignore policies that the, the Liberals are proposing. If there's something we can work with. The question was, the question was whether it, the question was, could it be dangerous um, for the economy and for the housing market? And, uh, you, you, you sort of indicated there might be a risk there. No, I think, no, I think it's always prudent to, to be careful. People should never borrow more than they can okay. comfortably afford to repay, even when interest rates eventually go up. All right, let's um, hear from another panellist, Richard Di Natale. I'll come back to you in a minute. It's a really good question, Philippa and, and Martin, and we do have serious concerns about this policy. Uh, we've just had a Royal Commission into the banking and finance sector, something that the Greens led and uh, we helped to ensure happened. And uh, what we saw was uh, a long history of unscrupulous, uh, unsustainable lending practices from the banks. Tony, you mentioned the GFC, and the GFC was triggered because people were trapped in a debt spiral. They uh, were given incentives uh, to enter into loans that they couldn't afford. Uh, we're seeing a downturn in the property market. Negative equity is a real possibility, absolutely. Uh, and, of course, the policy has a potential to be inflationary and drive up house prices and be counterproductive. So uh, we, we think there are better ways of addressing housing affordability. Negative gearing is absolutely addressing negative gearing and capital gains tax as incentives. I mean, why should someone buying their third or fourth or fifth home be given an advantage over a first home buyer? I mean, that's unfair and it's unsustainable. And, again, the Greens campaigned for many years to reform negative gearing and capital gains tax, and we're pleased that Labor has supported... Okay, we're slightly big off the mark policy. here of the question we're talking oh, about. Oh, well, it so. goes to how you actually address housing affordability. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and you, you address... We're, we're trying to keep everyone's answers to a minute, so sure. give a brief response and I'll go... Well, I think it. I've given my response, Tony. You, you don't deal with it through a policy that gets young people in a debt trap, and they may be facing a lifetime to pay off a property where they've got negative equity. So at the end of paying that off... Their house is actually worse le worth less than the investment they've made. It's, it's, a, it's not a sensible idea. It's been panned by a, a range of economists. And I'm disappointed that Labor backed it in. I think Labor should have held strong. I know that there was obviously a political imperative here. Uh, but it was a desperate attempt from the government in the last week to an election who have okay. been silent on housing for years and years. Helen. Yeah, Tony, um, thanks for the question, Martin and Philippa. I, th I think 
what's tricky about this is that we're hearing about this a few days out from uh, the election day. So that makes it terribly difficult to do any decent analysis as to whether this is a good policy. I understand that a uh, similar policy is in place in New Zealand. I'm pleased that the major parties are talking about housing affordability and I know young people in particular are pleased that housing affordability has made it onto the agenda. Um, so I know that uh, for some young people or first home buyers, their parents stump up uh, the deposit on a first home, but not all young people have that privilege. So perhaps this is a leveller. I'd like to see it reviewed after some time if it comes in and uh, see if it's actually working. Yeah, OK, well, you do get a, to respond to that, and, uh, but very briefly, um, this is sort of like a rabbit pulled out of the hat uh, at the last minute, and evidently no economic modelling, as we cool. heard this morning, has gone into testing this policy. Well, Tony, if we'd had our campaign launch on Sunday and not announced new policies, I'm sure you and others would have criticised it as well. In the end, you expected a campaign launch that we will announce a policy direction. And this is an important one. It's built, as Helen acknowledged, uh, on 10 years of lived experience in New Zealand. So we're taking their model. We know that it can work in helping homeowners get into the market sooner. Uh, we're doing it in tandem with our existing policies. So does that mean to you look at the New Zealand modelling in order we, to assess we this? Looked, well, we've looked at the lived experience of New Zealand, Tony. You don't have to look at theoretical modelling. You've actually got a lived experience across the ditch but in New Zealand. You've got a treasury where they've that done could have done modelling for, for you, and you didn't to show avail yourself how the model that opportunity. Works. Uh, we have made sure uh, that we've looked at how this policy works to help people get into the home ownership market. Okay. That's something the Liberal Party's been proud of for many years in terms of negative equity questions. There's only one party at this election who have policies that are going to drive down the value of homes, and that is indeed the negative gearing policy of the Labor Party, okay. which will take, right. thousands, of, okay. take <laughs> thousands of people Housing out of the property have market. Housing prices under you, Simon. Housing prices have you, fallen. Like it's, you, it, it's, Tanya, a couple of years ago, you not... were happily saying that <laughs> eliminating negative gearing would reduce it. house prices. Now we, you deny. We're saying that it's a, it levels the playing field, and that people who are investing in their seventh or it, tenth or thirtieth property should not have it a takes tax It thousands of buyers out of the market. That has got to reduce prices, Tanya. First home buyer. All right. Right. You're watching the last Q&A before the election, as I'm sure you can guess. The next question comes from Molly Yates. Hi. Um, this question is for Tanya Plibersek. Um, I'm a disability support pensioner. Previously, I was on NUSAT for quite a while, um, which is only $39 a day, basically. Mm -hmm. um, the Guardian says that 82% of Labor voters would support a raise to NUSAT, which is currently well below the poverty line. I think it's about $270 a week. Um, the University of Canberra recommends raising it by $75 a week, which according to their modelling would cost about $2 billion. Um, could you live on $39 a day and can you commit to an immediate raise of the rate of new start? I, I couldn't live on $39 a day. I, I, I accept that it is really difficult. And the reason we're doing a review of new start is because we understand that people uh, are not just living in poverty, but it's preventing them getting out of poverty by getting a job. It's, it's hard to afford the public transport or, you know, a, a new shirt to wear to your job interview. And it's not just Labor that says this, it's not just you, it's a, a number of business organisations that have acknowledged this. But we need to be methodical. We can't just pluck a number out of the air. We need to be methodical about how we determine uh, both the um, uh, amount that New Start should be, the impact on the budget, how we afford it. We just need. I, I know it's frustrating for people who'd like uh, immediate it sounds answers. Like, it sounds uh, like you're saying it will go up. We just can't tell you now by how much. Well, I, I think Is that what you're saying? I think there's a broad acknowledgement that it's an inadequate. Uh, it's an inadequate payment, and if you not can't just... if you can't live on it, then it must go up, isn't that right? Well, well, we. I, I don't know how to say it more clearly. There is an acknowledgement across the community, hmm. business, that it is an inadequate payment. That it's I'll, I'll go back. Well, I'll go back to the question. She's got a hand up, so yeah. perhaps she would want a clarification. Um, so I'm 26 years old. New Start hasn't raised since I was one year old. I understand the need for a review because I think welfare reform is really important. We basically need to overhaul the whole system. But why not raise it by 10, 20, $50 a fortnight in the meantime? Like $20 of like a fortnight, five meals for someone on New Start. Yeah. Um, I, I, I can't... Um... I can't give you a better answer than we have to be methodical about it. Are you we saying don't... you can't argue with the logic that uh, it does need to go up and you acknowledge that? I agree that it would be very, very difficult to live on Newstart. Absolutely. Mm. Simon Birmingham. Um, 
I think you can see from Tanya, there's a disconnect between the intention Labor's trying to convey here at this election uh, by saying they have a review, everybody's expectation of a review is that New Start will go up. Yet on Friday of last week, uh, the Shadow Treasurer and the Shadow Finance Minister for the Labor Party were out there being all very bold about the size of the alleged surpluses they say that the Labor Party will deliver. Do you know in those costings how much was budgeted to increase the rate of New Start? Nothing at all. Nothing at all. Well, you can't so, pick a number if you don't. So, well, Tanya, either your you costings just are wrong. Out of the air. So, so I can tell you that. Can I just say you're, you're doing? You're doing. Dollar, you you're uh, sound uh, like. Uh, can I just say this? You sound like you're in opposition. The question is, <laughs> what would either of you do? Tony, so, so what? Tony, would, Tony, so, Tony, so what we're would not. The, John Howard, your former prime minister, has said the freeze has gone on too long. He said this. Uh, before the last budget, not this it's, budget, the last budget. It's not a freeze, Tony. New Start is adjusted. John for Howard inflation called it a freeze. A I'm using his words. Well, he was wrong. New Start is adjusted <laughs> twice a year for inflation. <laughs> um, quite happy to say that. Uh, and in the end, so are you, you saying know, it's appropriate? There is no. No. What I'm pointing out here is uh, we're not making promises we can't keep at this election. You're we're not. not making, we're not the ones not saying we're going to have massive start. surpluses and we're going to have a review into New Start for which we've not budgeted a single cent to increase the rate of New Start. Either Labor's costings are wrong or there will be no increase to New Start. The same can be said in terms of Labor promises about increasing the rate of international development assistance. Again, same can I just bring you to the question as to whether you would have a commitment in government to raise New Start, even to have a review into raising New Start? And, and can I just put you the question that was raised by Molly, which is, could you live off $39 a day? Well, Tony, I, I acknowledge that would be incredibly, incredibly difficult. Um, now, most people on Newstart receive a number of supplementary payments, <laughs> rental assistance and other payments. I'm just saying what the facts are. Most people on Newstart uh, also come off of Newstart, thankfully, in terms of getting a job. Uh, and that is the priority of our government, to keep the economy strong, to make sure that there are job opportunities. Simon, Molly has people. a hand up again, so I'm going to go back to the questioner. Go ahead. Um, yes, you do make a point about supplementary payments. Um, I think it's only something like 40% of people on Newstart receive a supplementary payment. Mm -hmm. And even then, with your supplements, your payment's probably about the weekly cost of a one-bedroom unit. It's still far below the poverty line. Um, and as for Labor not re releasing costings, I haven't seen one thing from the Liberal Party about Newstart. No, well, as, as I said, we are, we are not making false promises at this election. The Labor Party are. The okay. Labor Party right. go to this election okay. saying, right. on the one okay. hand, big right. surpluses, you, you, on the Simon, other hand, you've made unfunded the, you've promises made this oppositional start. point. Let's Tony, hear from the other um, panellists. Go ahead. Something very surely, surely Richard will insist that Labor do it in government anyway if they would Absolutely. Win. Absolutely we will. You're there you go. damn right about that. Um, well, I don't look, think Richard will be Tanya. determining well, well, Labor policy well, if we form government. Something, something, very, something very profound like has happened. Something yours. very profound he may not has happened. Even be in the he may not even be in the parliament. Richard will be. I said like Kai Palmer's determining uh, his. Sorry, Richard, I didn't right. mean to interrupt. Okay, Richard, you get a chance to answer yeah. this question. Go well, ahead. Something very profound has happened to the way we treat people who need support in this country, and it's happened over a number of years. People are discriminated against, they're marginalised, they're stigmatised. Uh, they're basically forced to live a life without dignity. Now, 40 bucks a day isn't enough to put food on the table and pay the rent. People are living in poverty in a country like Australia and it's completely unacceptable. Of course we can afford to raise New Start. Of course we can. And we should. And there's this coalition of groups. It's really interesting. You're seeing the welfare sector, groups like ACOS, the business community all saying, just do it. $75 a week, increase new start. If you have to you know, eat into your surplus, do it. But give people some dignity. Because right now, they're living a life of poverty in a country as wealthy as Australia is completely unacceptable. Okay. Robo debt, drug testing of welfare recipients, the list goes on and on and on. We've got unemployment because there are more people than jobs in this country. And those people who can't find work should be able to feed themselves and put a roof over okay, their head. OK, let's hear... Uh, how does this look from... Thank you. How does this look from regional Australia? Molly, thank you so very much for your question. As an independent in a rural and regional seat from Indi, I absolutely support your call for a raising of the new start rate. Um, I know from the information I've 
heard from people on the ground, young people who I meet, but also from ACOS, that New Start is at 40% of the minimum wage. And I know, again, from young people I meet, that it is impossible to live on that amount of money. A young woman in my electorate came to me only recently and uh, told me her story of being on New Start. She'd moved from the country. She went down to Melbourne to study at the University of Melbourne. She was doing well, she became unwell, she was unable to continue her university studies. Uh, she had a part-time job, she was unable to continue her part-time job. Uh, she went on to New Start, she, it was impossible to pay the rent and remain in Melbourne. She came back to live with her parents again and she is really struggling with her mental health and uh, trying to survive really. Uh, so for her to even go and look for work is incredibly difficult on that amount of money to, as Tanya said, I, I think before, you know, to buy a set of clothes, to go to a job interview. Add to that again that in a rural community many of the job applications are online and some rural Australians actually can't get online, they don't have decent NBN. Um, the other thing to say about this, that uh, if, if in fact the new start rate was risen, it would have a very good impact on regional Australia. Mm. We know from Deloitte Access Economics report mm. on this that in the first year $4 billion would be injected back into the community mm. and of the 20 areas where uh, the most benefit would, would be, most of them are in regional Australia. So if, if I'm elected this Saturday, I'll be pushing whoever's in government to do something about New Start. Good thank on you. you uh, thank you very much. Let's move along. Thank you. The next question comes from Rachel Kappa. Rachel. Uh, Helen Haynes, in the event of a hung parliament, which party would you align yourself with and why? Uh, Thank you for that question, Rachel. It's a really important question. It's a rare event in Australian federal politics, but of course it did happen in 2010. There's uh, a couple of ifs there. Uh, if I was elected on Saturday and if there was a hung parliament. And I guess if I was elected and there was a hung parliament, uh, my phone would probably ring <laughs> on Sunday morning. Yes. And it would probably ring twice. It would probably ring from Scott Morrison and, and uh, it would probably ring from Bill Shorten. And at that point, I'd like to have a conversation with both of them because uh, neither of the major parties have spoken to some of the crucial issues that are affecting rural and regional Australia. And the first one of those is rural health. Mm. I haven't heard anyone in this election, uh, present company excluded, talking about the significant burden of disease in rural Australia and the, the need that we have for a cogent rural health strategy. So that would be the first thing. I'd be asking both, uh, both leaders of the parties to talk to me, please, about what they had in mind for a comprehensive infrastructure plan for rural and regional Australia so that we could boost our economy, so that we could grow in prosperity, so that we could thrive rather than survive. And thirdly, I'd be asking both leaders, please spell out for me what the climate policy is for rural and regional Australia mm. and how we can jump onto the renewables boom and really experience growth that we haven't anticipated, we haven't experienced in, in generations. Um, do you traditionally lean either way, um, coalition or Labor? I grew up on a dairy farm in southwest Victoria. My parents were country party voters. And uh, like many people in rural and regional Australia, my family uh, abandoned what was the country party and then became the national party. Uh, I've, I've voted for many parties across my long career as an adult voter, so I don't lean to either. I'm, I'm looking for policy. I'm looking for policy and leadership. OK, let's move on. We've got quite a few questions tonight. Um, we'll just leave that with you. Uh, the next one comes from Zion Dester. My question is for Richard Giannatale. As a supporter of many Greens policies, I'd like to ask why the Greens have pre-selected a multi-millionaire candidate for Kuyong, who spent most of his law career defending the big end of town and who until recently was a member of a prestigious men's only club. Isn't that antithetical to what the Greens stand for? It's a really good question. And um, let me just say, Julian Burnside is uh, an outstanding human being. I've known Julian for a number of years. He's a person of deep integrity. He spent his uh, latter years defending the rights of innocent people who have been persecuted and locked up in offshore detention centres. Uh, he's done a lot of work, most of that pro bono, by the way. Yes, he's, uh, he's wealthy, um, but that doesn't preclude him from having values that are Greens values. He's somebody who is deeply committed to taking action on climate change. We had a poll uh, just recently, Tony, where... Uh, the Liberal vote in Kuyong has collapsed and it's now a Liberal-Greens marginal contest. We're talking um, about the Treasurer's seat, Josh. The Treasurer's Frydenberg seat, yes. here. What sort of preference flow 
would Julian Burnside have to get to win that extraordinary, that would be an extraordinary event if he did, to win that seat? Because we know there's a number of candidates. Wouldn't yeah. he have to get all the preferences pretty much from Oliver Yates, no. who's no. a former Liberal? No, he doesn't need to get all the preferences, but obviously the more that he gets, the more likely his chance of getting over the line is. The Liberal vote there has collapsed. It's collapsed because people are sick of the inaction on climate change. I mean, that Prime Minister of the country brings a lump of coal into the Parliament and waves it around. It was an embarrassment, an international embarrassment. And the Liberal Party... Um, you vote for the Liberal Party, you're voting for the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef, the collapse of the Murray-Darling Basin, more floods, more fires. That's what a vote for Scott Morrison means. And people in seats like Kuyong, traditional Liberal voters, one action on climate change. Quick one, because here's, here's another seat like Kuyong, Kelly O'Dwyer's old seat of Higgins. Um, I understand there's a poll coming out, an essential poll coming out tomorrow. Uh, are you able to tell us what it says? I will understand it might have even just been published this evening. Uh, again, it shows that the Greens are a, a strong chance of winning that seat. In fact, it's got us in front. Again, a Greens Liberal marginal contest, where the contest is between the Greens and the Liberal Party. And these are two seats that belong to Prime Ministers and Treasurers. People in those seats have never been in such a powerful position to send a message to the Liberal Party to say, we are sick of your inaction on climate change. We want an end to the climate wars. They have never been in such a powerful position. By voting Green, by voting for Julian Burnside and Jason Ball, who is an outstanding candidate in Higgins, we can actually say, we're going to put this chapter behind us. We're going to transition away from coal to renewables. We're going to take advantage okay, we're going of to talk, hundreds uh, of Richard, thousands of jobs. We're going to talk more about climate that. change in a moment. But just on the politics of this, Tanya Plibersek, if the Greens ended up picking up two extra seats uh, in Victoria in the House of Representatives, you, you'd have to deal with them seriously, wouldn't you? Well, I... <laughs> Potentially, um, I, I've been you might be doing that deal with Richard. I, I've been campaigning a lot in Higgins, and I, I've got to say, the reception that our candidate there is getting, uh, Fiona McLeod, is extraordinary. So, uh, Richard, I, I wouldn't be counting those seats uh, in I'm your column just, no, just I'm not yet. counting anything. No, um, not But they are Greens Liberal marginal contests now. Well. <laughs> According to one poll that I haven't seen that you claim. But anyway, I don't know. Um, look, anyway, do you want to repeat the, um, the notion, no deals with the Greens, no Green <laughs> Labor Alliance again? Because we no, have heard that a few times. Well, uh, but you know, would you have to rethink it if something, no, if the unthinkable happened? No. Because when we were last in government no, with no, a minority... No, you're repeating the statement or no, there wouldn't be a deal? Uh, when we were last in government with a minority government, we had to work with the Greens and the Independents, the crossbench, uh, bill by bill. We got through four, more than 400 pieces of legislation. Mm. We agreed on some of them, yep. we disagreed on some yep. of them, we went uh, bill by bill, case by case. It is um, difficult and time consuming and uh, I think much better if people vote clearly for a Labor government. If you want real action on climate change, by a government that can implement the change, then vote Labor. OK, Don't so Simon, Simon Birmingham has uh, been wanting to jump in on this. Quick response. Well, firstly, you've just heard Tanya confirm that a Labor-Greens alliance is something she'd be comfortable oh, with and, uh, and would happily, uh, happily embrace. Can I, just suggest, <laughs> can I just suggest that is absolutely putting words into someone's mouth? No, no, you, invite, as, you invited as, Tanya. As, as the moderator, no, I'll have to Tony. say that I heard what she said yes. and it wasn't that. Well, We're all in the same Tony, room, Simon. Tony, <laughs> you just invited Tanya to say... Would she rule out a Labor Greens deal again? Yeah, I, and she did I, not. I said it at the beginning of no, the you program. Didn't. We don't want to go into coalition. No, you with don't the Greens. want to. We but you want will. to win. This so if you want the... stability, if you want an end to the chaos, sure. vote if, Labor in the House of Representatives. Everybody wants to win, Tanya. Vote Labor in the Senate. But you're quite happy to do the deal with Richard but and Simon, the Greens. But Simon, you know that house that we both do like every like called the Senate. Do you know that place we work in? <laughs> no, no government has a majority in the Senate. And it's happened a couple of times in the history of. Federation. Yep. So whoever wins government has to work, work with, with the, Senate. the Senate. And whether it's a Liberal government or a Labor government, we hope it's a Labor government. Or a government. Clive Palmer government. Well, <laughs> well this is, a, this is, this is a, the decision that the uh, Liberals no. have made, that they yeah. prefer to have Clive Palmer, indeed the LNP in Queensland would prefer to have One Nation, than the Greens yeah. and other progressive yeah. independent voices. Now, whoever wins, and as I said, I hope it is the Labor Party and I hope that 
Uh, Tanya is, the next, is a minister yeah. in the government, and I hope that we can... It's very cosy we over well, there. Well, well, in I'm, the I'm, end... I'm, I'm being, I'm being, uh, there's something. a little voice in my ear telling me there's lots of questions out there and we better get to okay. some more of them. Um, so, Helen, you want to get in? I you just do want to get in there because I think if we look at the last Parliament of Australia, look at the stabilising effect of the crossbench. Absolutely. You know, when we had all the destabilisation, losing a Prime Minister, it was the crossbench, really, that held the Parliament together. Do you think Clive and Palmer would be a stabilising influence? Well, I'm not sure about <laughs> Clive, but I, I think what we saw with the independence in the last Parliament was some very, very good governance. Okay, dokie. Okay. Um, members here... Is, is there an example? Well, I think you just have to look for the... Uh... Simon, <laughs> don't get I'm to now run that example? Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims tonight, I'm not saying that was one of them, let us know on Twitter. <laughs> Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. You're watching Q&A live. The next question comes from Todd Fernando. Uh, with 50% of Aboriginal populations at the age of 23, we are now seeing thousands become first in families and communities to enter tertiary education. This new generation of Aboriginal people will no longer be a burden on the state. Instead, we will become active contributors to the economy, paying taxes, repaying hex tax and building Indigenous businesses. Uh, in many ways, the gap will begin to close for this generation as we, as we see a shift from the low socioeconomic working class to the middle class. Um, and this generation must be seen as a positive return on strong investments and activisms of the past. Um, so what will your parties do to end the cycle of poverty and begin to grow a strong Aboriginal middle class? Uh, start with Tanya. Uh, fantastic question. Thank mm. you very much. Mm. And one of the reasons we've seen such strong growth in uh, tertiary attendance by in Indigenous Australians is uh, when we were last in government, we uncapped numbers. And I think from memory, it was a 105% increase in the in the number of Indigenous students to go, going to university. That's why we were so opposed to the government recapping student places at university. We will uncap them again. That means 200,000 more people get the chance to go to university over a decade. University, going to university can close the gap in a generation. It's a fantastic thing to do. Um, but it's not only university. We have to make sure TAFE is accessible, affordable, high quality. And it starts with... Um, parents as first educators, strong families, supporting strong families, three and four year old preschool, uh, attendance uh, at early learning so that kids start school ready to learn, uh, $14 billion extra investment in public schools under labour. So from early childhood education throughout the educational life, we need to invest more strongly, make sure quality is higher. We also have a $174 million um, equity plan uh, that would encourage universities to partner and TAFEs to partner with schools to uh, lift the expectation and the desire to go to university in communities where attendance rates are low. That's a minute. There, is a, a, there is a huge disparity, mm. uh, particularly between city communities, regional, rural communities, so making sure that we give people across Australia the opportunity to go to university uh, is important. Todd, just before I pass this around, um, does the emergence of, a, of an Indigenous middle class you're talking about suggest there may be a difference in the way they vote? Um, yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. I... Are you prepared to vote for the Liberal Party, the party of small business? Not this round. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, it's, you know, we're, we're trying to shift from this deficit, damage-centred approach. And so we want parties to really think about, you know, the experiences of young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are finishing rates that we've never seen before. We're yeah. participating in the economy in ways that we've never, never seen in the past. And it's, yes, it's all good and well to say that we want to have you know, young kids going to school and finishing and supports in there. But what I think a lot of parties miss is the fact that when we graduate, we, we just kind of float around. So there's no supports that are in that place to really support us to continue into corporate businesses, into, into Business Australia, into not-for-profit. So we're, we're kind of, you know, we're, we're ready at that level to really go okay. above and beyond rather than just get your kids to school. Thanks, Todd. I'll throw that to Simon Birmingham, former Education Minister, it yeah. must be said, um, but you don't have his vote this time round. That's, uh, that, but, Todd, I want to thank you for the really positive way in which you framed that question. Uh, far too often when we talk about Indigenous policy in Australia, it comes from a deficit perspective and of course there's still huge disadvantage for us to address. Uh, but you're right to highlight the huge gains that are being made by individuals, by families in, in advancing themselves. And as Education Minister, I remember receiving the Closing the Gap report a couple of years ago uh, and being, you know, of course, overwhelmed by the challenge that still existed 
but thrilled that the one target that was standing out as being on track uh, was in terms of year 12 completion rates amongst young Indigenous Australians and that translates into the higher university exits. Now in terms of policies that we've delivered and for the future, one of the policies that we're really proud of as a government relates to government procurement targets that have said uh, that a certain proportion of government procurement needs to go to Indigenous businesses so that we actually grow a core within Australian business and industry of Indigenous owned, Indigenous run businesses. We're backing that up at this election in my now portfolio of, uh, of tourism, where we put $40 million aside to build more Indigenous tourism businesses around Australia. Sure because we know I'm sorry to that say. many of the visitors to Australia want authentic traditional experiences of culture. Uh, and of course, we've got 60,000 years of culture to share in this country. I'm going to move on. Uh, the next question is on climate change. It comes from Scott Walker. This is my first time voting in a federal election and it's something that I've been waiting a long time for. It seems to me that this election and its outcome directly pit, pits younger Australians against older Australians. We see the Deputy Prime Minister refer to a record enrolment of young voters as one of the biggest problems we've got this election, and the Coalition again and again focused on tax cuts for the wealthy, but no vision for Australia. Why should younger people even consider voting for the coal-loving Prime Minister and a government which considers us the problem and consistently leaves us out of the national debate and not turn to parties that want to see real action on climate change, invest in Australia's future and not just give us surplus for surplus sake. Uh, Simon Birmingham, um, it's not purely about climate change. There's a broader point there. Well, um, uh, thanks, thanks, Scott. It was a fairly loaded question, so I suspect you might be a little tough for us to persuade. But uh, nonetheless, in terms of to the broader audience who are watching tonight, I think it's important to know yeah, our policies are about delivering action on climate change. You know, Back in 2013, uh, when the government changed, many people said that if you eliminated the carbon tax, we'd never meet the 2020 Kyoto 2 targets. We will meet them, we will exceed them as a country. And we did that without the carbon tax, but through investment in other ways, investment that continues to see renewables grow, investment in better farm management practices and soil management. Uh, we've outlined our 2030 targets. They're different from the Labor Party's targets, but they're real targets that honour but per GDP basis or emissions intensity level are among some of the leading targets. So we're, gonna, in the we're world. going to keep talking about climate change um, in a moment. Can I? Uh, and I've, we got your main point there, but oh, um, the generational really. gap, the generational gap that he's referring to, exemplified in a way by uh, Michael McCormack's cower breakout, if we can uh, refer to it that, where he said uh, one of the biggest problems we've got is the fact that we've got a lot of young people voting for the first time. I know this sounds dreadful, who probably never known how good they've got it. Um, you, was, that, was that moment there something that obviously a number of our questioners have picked up on, um, a bit of a problem for you, strategically? Well, Scott, I think making sure that, well, Tony and to Scott and everybody else, I think we need to make sure that people understand what is being achieved. You know, last financial year, we saw more than 100,000 jobs filled by young Australians, new jobs, for the first time ever the largest number in terms of new jobs created and filled. You don't, in the end, get ahead in life, get to buy a house, or have economic security for you and your family, your loved ones, if you don't get a job in the first place. And that is at the core of our message, to keep the economy strong, uh, to make sure we keep creating jobs for young Australians. We started this, uh, started this interview tonight talking about uh, our plans in terms of helping people get into the housing market uh, and reducing the barriers to do so. Uh, and ultimately, you know, the choice at this election is very strong. Uh, the policies that Tanya and Bill Shorten and the Labor Party have uh, for higher taxes in a range of ways uh, will lead to a weaker economy and will mean there are fewer job prospects in the future. OK, and that's... That, that, is, that is your minute, Simon. Uh, Tanya Plibersek. Well, we agree that um, jobs... Uh, work, that's really important. But we've got 1.8 million Australians who are unemployed or working fewer hours than they want. We've got a million Australians working two jobs to make ends meet. We need to make sure that we have jobs uh, generated, but that we also change our industrial relations system to make sure that people's penalty rates are restored, that they're getting a decent day's pay for a decent day's work. Of course, uh, we need to take action on climate change, uh, health and education. We talked about education a moment ago. Looking at healthcare, things like our sexual and reproductive health policy would be uh, an Australian first. Um, uh, when it comes to housing affordability, there's only one party 
um, that has been talking consistently about rental affordability through building our 250,000 National Rental Affordability Scheme properties and being able to get into the housing market when you're ready to do it. Uh, we've also said we'll have a Minister for Young People, uh, we'll re-establish a, a voice of young people to government as well. Um, you saw, I think, just how out of touch this government is with the way most young Australians think on the two real issues, climate change and marriage equality. I think any government that resisted marriage equality as hard as this government did uh, really is pretty out of touch with most young Australians. Richard Di Natale. Well, if we're going to talk about climate change in more detail in a moment, I won't... I'll restrict my answer to say, firstly, there are a lot of older people who do care about climate change and the huge intergenerational divide that we're facing. Uh, but, Scott, you're absolutely right uh, that you've got a current crop of politicians who benefited from cheap and affordable housing, uh, from a safe and stable climate, from free TAFE and uni, uh, who are trying to pull the drawbridge up after them. And you know, that, the arrogance of that comment from uh, Mr McCormack is a little insight into the thinking of the Liberal National Party. The bottom line is that we have an existential threat when it comes to climate change. It's not actually about Liberal, Labor or Green. This is about the survival of the human species. That's what we're confronting right now. The Great Barrier Reef. I don't know if my kids will ever get a chance to snorkel on a healthy Great Barrier Reef. Um, the collapse of the Murray-Darling, the fires, floods and so on. We have to deal with it. And, of course, making that transition creates jobs, if we do it properly. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to stop you there so we can go to that question specifically about climate change. It comes from Anna Roberts. A Climate Council report was uh, released last week on how climate change is damaging Australia's economy. It suggests that by 2050, uh, half the irrigated output from the Murray-Darling mm. Basin will, will have resulted. The Murray-Darling Basin is about 50% of Australia's agricultural output valued at $7.2 billion per year. What will you do to address the effects of climate change, water scarcity and food production, which particularly affect rural people and the environment? Uh, Helen, I'll start with you as a rural regional um, candidate, but um, uh, you, can, you don't have to say what you will do, but what should be done, perhaps? Thanks for the question, Anna. It's such an important question for rural and regional Australia where the impacts of climate, the impacts uh, of the Murray-Darling Basin plan at the moment are having direct effect on rural communities, on farming enterprises, on agricultural food production uh, and on the environment. And there's no people more aware of this than the people who live along um, those river, rivers and live in those farming communities. So. Um, certainly what I'm hearing during this election period in Indi is, is clear understanding that we're in real trouble there, uh, a, a frustration around uh, lack of leadership and policy direction around this, um, but also uh, a real white-hot rage around the governance, uh, in particular, of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. And uh, in particular, uh, farming communities who, who hear of uh, water buybacks uh, with profits going to, to companies domiciled in the Cayman Islands um, when farming communities are really struggling to survive and when they see uh, fish kills in our beautiful rivers. So That's it's an minute. extremely important question. Thank you for raising it. And uh, we're looking for leadership on this. Simon Birmingham. Um, Helen, we didn't hear too many plans there. Can I say that in terms of what we want to do uh, as a government is make sure that we do deliver on the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. We've already recovered uh, more than 2,100 billion litres uh, of water against the targets in that plan. It's a plan that has enjoyed bipartisan support through different, uh, different governments, but the point there is that you're recovering that water to make sure that you have the necessary environmental flows in the future. It's a challenge in terms of how you support rural and regional communities to do so. Uh, our policy and, and the major approach inquiry been, into how it's been well, conducted. Our, our policy and approach has been to eschew buybacks where you can and instead pursue uh, investment in water saving infrastructure that still gets the licences to meet those targets but does so uh, without hurting irrigation communities. It's a different policy. It's the one point of policy difference on the Murray-Darling Basin between the Labor Party and the Liberal Party. Labor uh, prefers buybacks. We prefer to invest in communities through those types of infrastructure projects. More, more generally on the climate change targets, of course, I spoke about our achievements to date there before, uh, but in terms of the Paris targets, we've outlined 
a $3.5 billion plan for how we'll meet those targets. It's detailed as to the different steps in terms of the role energy efficiency will that play, is your minute, uh, the, role, the role farming activities and, uh, and the like will take in terms of how we go into the market and purchase abatement. Uh, and it's much more detailed in the achievements than uh, Bill Shorten's policies are. OK, Tony Plibersek. Well, of course, we have to properly implement the Murray-Darling plan. Uh, Labor's also said we'd set aside $100 million a year um, to uh, help communities adjust to climate change and drought-proof. Um, but the, in the long term, we have to take uh, real action um, to uh, do our part internationally to prevent climate change. We know that the cost of natural disasters already is about $18 billion a year. It's set to double by 2038. Uh, so we, we, need to take, uh, we need to take real action. We can do that, you know, $100 million a year. Um, the, the government want to do something by getting rid of the Building Australia Fund. We think we can invest in infrastructure and also work to um, reduce the impact of drought in our communities, um, but long term it, it requires real action on climate change. Just a quick follow up on the climate change uh, thing, because uh, Australia's, uh, the temperature here will keep yeah. going up unless the rest of the world yeah. um, gets on board. So um, does Labor have a sort of plan here to use Penny Wong as a kind of global ambassador for climate change? I mean, she already fulfilled that role to some degree in Copenhagen. Yeah, we do need to take an international approach. Of course, uh, Australia can't do it on its own, but being part of an international effort is very important. Uh, of course, Penny would play a role in that, but we've also said we'd, we would have a climate change ambassador that would work particularly in the Pacific uh, with our neighbours in the Pacific that are really bearing the brunt of catastrophic climate change in their local communities already. It's the neighbours across the Pacific, uh, Donald Trump, that's going to be the uh, well, biggest <coughs> issue there, isn't it, in terms of making change? Look, I think um, taking action domestically is really necessary when we're making a, a case for international action. We have to do our share if we're talking to friends and neighbours around the world about doing their share too. Richard. Uh, great question, Anna, and I'd point you to our plan called Renew Australia for details, but in short, it's a transition away from coal to 100% renewable energy by 2030. Now, the single biggest cause of climate change is coal. That is a, a fact. We just can't escape that. So if you haven't got a plan to transition away from coal, then you don't actually have a climate plan. The mining, burning and exporting of coal is causing climate change. We've got a plan to transition away from coal to 100% renewable energy, which would create 180,000 new jobs, long-term jobs, sustainable jobs in regional communities. Jobs creating solar panels, solar farms for small-scale solar, large-scale solar, wind and so on. If we do this right, we actually can create jobs and a new export industry in hydrogen. For example, South Korea and Japan have said they want to move away from our coal. They're some of our biggest export markets. Let's start exporting renewable hydrogen. That's we can minute. do that. That's your minute. That's my minute. Yeah, I'm Jeez, sorry. a minute goes pretty quickly on this show, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, but you're a politician, so you would say that. Uh, the next question comes from Vaughan Sketcher. Hi, panel. Uh, my question tonight is for Simon Birmingham. As the current Minister for Tourism and Investment, are you confident that your government's $444 million investment in the Great Barrier Reef Foundation is the best value way to protect our most important tourist attraction. Simon Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for the, vo uh, for the question, Vaughan. And, uh, yes, but it's not the only way we're protecting it. Uh, so Do you need there's... to protect it, Simon? Uh, Simon, Because uh, Scott Morrison uh, said in his campaign launch, we've saved the Great Barrier Reef already. Um, <laughs> from, well done. From, well done, from, Greg Hunt. From listing. Do you want to read the full quote, Tony, or just an extract Well, he did say he was taking it off the endangered list, but it wasn't on one. But uh, it was uh, indeed under consideration for listing, oh. and we went through the process <laughs> to, uh, to ensure that did not occur. The substance of the question... His, um, his line was, we've saved the Great Barrier Reef. Well done, Greg Hunt. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and do you want to read the next sentence? I see you've well, got dot, dot, dot after that, Tony. Yes, that he said... Uh, so what, what's he the dot, was dot, talking dot? about taking off the endangered list, but yeah. there wasn't one. No, no, I think you're being selective in your quotes there. 
But, OK, so you um, haven't saved the Great Barrier Reef. The Prime Minister didn't get that quite right? No, I think you're being selective in your quote there okay. in terms of what he was referring to. Okay. We know there's ongoing work required in relation to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, that's why we've got a couple of billion dollars uh, in partnership with the Queensland Government uh, that works in a range of things in terms of addressing uh, the type of nutrient runoff that comes from soils and lands uh, throughout uh, Queensland that can run in and create issues in the Great Barrier Reef in terms of supporting the science and the resilience. Uh, in terms of that funding for the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, we know that that's going to leverage additional private sector funding to help complement that work. It's not the only thing we're doing, but it is absolutely a valuable investment in making sure that we use all of the different arms of uh, research and tourism and the local community uh, to be able to get the best possible effort okay. in terms of protecting the reef for the long term. Uh, Tanya Plibersek, you're going to keep this uh, $444 million investment uh, Great Barrier Reef Foundation? Uh, we're going to keep the investment but not in the foundation. We'll direct that money to um, the organisations that have traditionally worked, uh, government organisations, to protect the reef. We've also uh, set aside uh, $30 million for um, a reef HQ. We've also got a commitment to a plastics and recycling um, measure that seeks to reduce uh, the impact of plastics in our oceans, um, which is, uh, as all of you know, horrend horrendous and a growing problem. Uh, and um, we'll, of course, work again to protect our oceans. Uh, when we were last in government, we set aside uh, um, significant um, parts of our ocean environment to protect them. The Liberals on coming to government uh, reversed those protections and we would like to uh, restore those protections. So, uh, yes, we'd invest in the reef, um, yes, we'd tackle climate change, but um, plastics and broader protection for our oceans is also important. Richard Dinatale. Well, the, what you need to do to protect the reef is you've got to address climate change. You've got to transition out of coal rather than opening up new coal mines, like the Adani coal mine. You've got to not frack the Northern Territory. Um, I'm sad to say that the Labor Party have got a plan to open up 1,200 gas wells in the Northern Territory, uh, five times the impact of the Adani coal mine, $1.5 billion of public money to do it. It'll be a carbon bomb. Uh, the Labor Party wants to open up further... Uh, a coal fields. Uh, they want to open up the Galilee Basin. That's how you address it. But in terms of the half Are you a billion about dollars, the Liberal Party, then the Liberal Party, I'm afraid. Sorry, um, the the uh, the half a billion dollars that was given to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation should be the subject of an anti-corruption commission. It should be the first order of business. Half a billion dollars, no tender. Um, Malcolm Turnbull walks into a room and hands over, you know, the fossil fuel industry half a billion dollars and says, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, here's half a billion dollars, Re knock yourself really? out. Really? That's what you're alleging, Richard? Well, I think uh, you haven't uh, indicated that there have been any tender documents. Uh, it was, uh, in fact, the, uh, the um, allocation that was made didn't stand up to scrutiny and it was described by many people as one of the most flagrant abuses of public expenditure seen in this parliament. OK, well, I'm sorry, but you get a right to respond to that. Well, I, firstly, you know, I think that is a, a terrible smear in terms of on Malcolm Turnbull and you know, the approach you've taken there, Richard. Uh, I expect you know, you'll be ringing for an apology in the morning. But uh, in terms of the substance, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation was worthy from the Labor Party of receiving millions of dollars in public funding. How uh, many, Simon? It was about 13, about, I think it was, 13. Tanya. About <laughs> Um, so, 433. So, so, Tanya, <laughs> yes, indeed. Years later, uh, as an investment for the long term, not to be expended at once, but to be invested, to be leveraged and to actually get long-term results for the reef. Uh, you trusted the organisation to invest millions of dollars previously, yet you don't seem to trust it today just because we were the ones <coughs> giving the money for the reef. OK, well, there's a response now. Tanya, for right? the right to respond that you get is on the fracking question because um, there's just been a suggestion there from the Greens that Labor is going to open up fracking fields which will be worse, well, have worse consequences for greenhouse gases well, uh, than Well, I think what Richard's talking about is money that's been set aside that would be available for a gas pipeline from the Northern Territory. For fracked gas, the, that's right. Well, for natural gas uh, as well. Uh, 1,200 new, 1200 gas. new gas wells in the Northern uh, Territory. Well, the, what the Northern Territory Government does uh, in the Northern Territory after extensive consultation is a matter for them. So why build our, a pipeline our, if there's no gas? Well, there's conventional gas. 
This is for as the, well. So this is the 1,200 new gas fields in the Beetaloo Basin that would have five times the impact Richard, of we're, the Richard, um, we need to let Tanya sure, respond, sure, if sure. you don't mind. So the, the money is available for a pipeline because we are worried that gas shortages are... Uh, okay. potentially disastrous for Australian industry. This conventional, is export gas. Con conventional this gas is, for export. is running out. Uh, there are businesses telling us that they are going to close down. Uh, the government's done nothing to uh, retain Australian gas in Australia. We continue to sell it overseas when there are um, potential shortages in Australia and high prices, and that affects our industry very significantly. But okay. is for we, export gas, it's not it's so, not So I'm, I'm going to have to cut that one off. Sure. It's got too many things to go to. Uh, the next question comes via Skype. It's from Harry Chiam from Rosebury in New South Wales. Last week, the Daily Telegraph misrepresented Bill Shorten's mother's story in a front page article. The Murdoch newspapers have an agenda to perpetuate a conservative point of view, which is also, for example, anti-climate change. If Labor comes into power, how would it handle a hostile press intent on undermining its policy? Daniel Plibersek, we'll start with you. Uh, look, I, uh, I think there's a couple of issues there. I think what, um, what happened with that story with Bill's mum last week was pretty awful, and I think Bill, Bill dealt with that well, and I don't really want to go back there. Uh, the issue of the role that News Corp have played in this election, the very clear uh, line that they're taking in this election, well, that's kind of no surprise either. I mean, this is a company that paid no company tax between 2013 and 2017. Um, they, don't, they don't want uh, a government that's going to close down tax loopholes that multinationals make use of. Um, it's pretty clear that Rupert Murdoch would like a say in the election uh, from New York, uh, but I don't think the vast majority of Australians would... Um, I mean, I think everybody values their vote. They'll make their own mind up. I don't Can think I they'll just be... Just a, a quick question to... on that. Um, yep. Do you think this election is going to be a test of whether Rupert Murdoch still wields the kind of political power uh, that he once did in the, in the days of digital media? Is his power waning? I think it's more a test of whether negativity and scare campaigns can win out over a bold and positive agenda. We've been for years now laying out our plans in detail. People can make their judgments about whether they think it's more important to protect tax loopholes for multinationals and millionaires or whether I think it's more important to invest in hospitals and schools. That's what this comes down to. Let's hear from uh, Helen. Yeah, I, th I think that's a great question and I think from a, a rural and regional perspective we actually have a different uh, landscape when it comes to the press. We have lots of small newspapers, family owned and locally run and uh, indeed those local newspapers uh, would at their peril um, say trash talk local candidates for, a, for an election campaign because uh, those local candidates are well known in the community. So I think it's a great strength uh, that we still have those family run newspapers and this notion of lack of diversity in the press is a really important one nationally. I think Australians want to know that uh, they have clear, transparent press and when they see one newspaper barracking uh, for one side, then they lose trust and, and, and that's not a good thing. I guess the other thing I would say is that uh, in supporting the small newspapers, the Wangaratta Chronicle, the Yay Chronicle, the, you know, the Benalla Ensign, all of those marvellous North East Victorian newspapers, I, you know, I thank them and I hope that they survive and I also make the point that we also have uh, local uh, regional television, which tells our stories and reports the local issues. You don't hear much about the regional seats in the national press. Uh, Simon Birmingham, uh, did the Daily Delegra Telegraph uh, do a lot of damage to your campaign at a critical moment with their own goal on Bill Shorten's mother? Um, political commentators can talk about the political impact. Uh, I think the story uh, should not have been written, should not have been published. Uh, uh, and I think, as Tanya said, it's been dealt with. Uh, Bill dealt with it. Scott dealt with it. Um, I think in terms of you know, media commentary and the way the media runs, you know, Australians in a country with a free media are free to choose not to read a newspaper that they think are, is biased, just as they're free to choose not to watch a television program that they think is biased, and they're free to go and get their media from whatever source uh, they choose. I worry a little bit that I think too many people are drawing back into only getting their media and information from sources that they agree with a lot of the time, 
rather than actually letting it be tested elsewhere. But you know, this election is not about the media in Australia. This election is about competing policies and uh, Tanya claimed a bold and positive vision for Australia. Uh, we think that it's expensive and risky and the $387 billion of additional taxes the Labor Party is claiming. Okay, Tanya, I, Tanya, saying, Tanya, so no, I just want to... Tanya mentioned multinationals. Yeah, you'll get I just a chance to, make to sum point, up in a minute, which appears to be what you're doing right now. That on multinationals, 2% of Labor's $387 billion comes from multinationals. Okay, so the question, the question was on the media. I'm going paid to move to uh, Richard Di Natale. Quick answer. Oh, look, um, News Corp is a malignant influence on our democracy. They're not a... They're not... <laughs> News Corp, they're not, a, they're not a media outlet. They're the propaganda arm of the hard right of the Liberal Party and they're becoming increasingly um, hysterical. They incubate hate. Uh, and uh, the question really is, what do we do about it? And what we need to do is we need to make sure we've got one of the most concentrated media markets in the world. Simon, people don't have a choice in many places because all they get is a News Corp paper. So we've got to have a public interest test when it comes to media mergers. It's one of the things we're putting forward. We've got to strengthen the powers of ACMA, the regulator, to hold these voices to account. And I'll tell you, one of the... A bulwark against News Corp is a well-funded ABC. Uh, the ABC um, and SBS, which is, why, which is why we've committed five years of funding, but not just five years of funding, and we, uh, we, we welcome the commitment from the Labor Party, but locked into legislation so that a future government can't get their hands on it because they don't like having a strong public broadcast. OK, we've got time for one last question. It comes from Pierre Lay. Thanks, Tony. My question is for the whole panel. In this election, we've heard all sides trying to secure our votes with near to medium term policy sweetness. But as the Chinese proverb goes, our forebears must plant the trees so their offspring may enjoy the shade in years to come. Can you tell us what sacrifices our generation must make in order for our future generations to have a viable Australia to live in and to thrive? OK, it's a big issue, but we've only got time for brief answers. Helen Haynes. Uh, thanks for the question, Pierre, and it's a beautiful proverb. Um, I think that if there's any sacrifices we have to make, if, if they are ones that will enable us to have a safe climate, then I'm willing to make them. I'm willing to make them for, the, for my children and for my grandchildren. So uh, if that means uh, some economic adjustment in order to transition to renewable energy, uh, to reduce emissions in our other areas, including agriculture with good support and R&D for our farming community, then, uh, then I'm willing to do that. So uh, just briefly, uh, are you suggesting, as Shorten has suggested, that the cost of inaction is so large that the cost of doing it doesn't need to be scrutinised? Uh, no, I don't think anything uh, ever excludes scrutiny. But what I'm suggesting is that there's real opportunity but often when we're embracing opportunity, we have to take some short-term pain. Uh, so maybe we do. I, I think, you know, we have 10 years uh, and amazing things happened in a decade. They do, if we give them the opportunity. Simon Birmingham. Yeah, thanks so much for your question. And uh, I think we have to recognise that government doesn't have all of the solutions and that the idea that uh, politicians who come along and promise that large licks of government spending are going to solve everything, it's not the answer. It's not going to solve things and often it just creates uh, more waste or more problems along the way. Uh, and so this election, you know, we're asking people to, as much as anything, back themselves, back the fact that we have a country uh, that is an incredibly strong and resilient and successful nation, back the fact that their ingenuity and drivers created a strong economy and jobs uh, and that we can continue to do that and through that, generation of business growth and jobs in the future, uh, the 1.3, 1.25 million jobs that we're planning to uh, help create, uh, you're going to be able to continue to invest in the type of services in schools, in hospitals, in roads that people rely upon and be able to make wise, smart investments to address other challenges like climate change. So no one has to take any sacrifices? Well, no, I'm just saying, you, I mean... Uh, make any are, sacrifices? I think the sacrifices are that you can't just accept or expect that governments come along and spend endlessly and that somehow that is going to solve everything. That's, in the end, if you look at the big spending promises our opponents have made this okay. election, there's a lot of promises being made there. 
We're not promising the earth, and we're saying that we can continue to make sure that we offer good, hopeful opportunities for Australians okay. in terms of we, their jobs, their families, their lives. Richard Di Natale? Well, we won't have an earth if we don't act on climate change, so that's certainly something we need to do. But um, it's, a really, it's a really good question. When it comes to making the transition away from coal to renewable energy, um, there, are going, there is going to be disruption. And regardless of what we do, uh, there are people who are going to lose their jobs. Because, as Paul Keating said, the era of coal's over. I think the responsibility we have is to look after people through that transition, and in particular coal workers who are, who are going to be affected by this, regardless of the decisions that governments take. Um, our plan, of course, is to manage that transition, to look after people, and I suppose we should all acknowledge that that disruption uh, might come at a cost, and that our responsibility is to look after those people, which is why I, I think if we have an opportunity to talk to the Labor Party after the election, because we've had a strong result in the Senate, or indeed the lower house, one of the first things we want to talk about is what does that plan look like for people who are going to lose their jobs? How do we make sure they've got long-term employment? We've got a plan to do that, uh, a just transition fund. That's your minute. And that's something that we all, I think we all need to focus on if we're going to make this work in a way that creates jobs for people, but looks after people through that transition. Tanya Plibersek, uh, another offer of a political marriage. You may not want to go there in your answer. Um, look, I, I agree with Richard and Helen that uh, climate change is critical for the next generation, but in terms of what we have to give up, what we have to give up are the unaffordable loopholes and the $77 billion of tax cuts for the very high income earners that this government has planned so that we can afford pension and dental, our cancer care package, properly funding our preschool schools, TAFEs and universities, infrastructure funding to build the productivity enhancing infrastructure that we need in our cities, the congestion busting infrastructure we need in our cities. We need to give up those unaffordable write-offs and loopholes for multinationals and millionaires so we can invest today in health and education and infrastructure and take real action on climate change. That's all we have. Thank you very much. That is all we have time for tonight. Please thank our panel, Richard Di Natale, Tanya Plibersek, Simon Birmingham and Helen Haynes. Thank you. You can continue the discussion on Facebook and News Radio, where Tracy Holmes and Professor James Avanitakis from the University of Western Sydney will be taking your calls. Next week on Q&A, Australian voters will have delivered their verdict. Will Scott Morrison be given three more years or will Bill Shorten be our new Prime Minister? Liberal national ministers are pretty hard to find, but former Defence Minister and Leader of the House Christopher Pine has agreed to join the panel, alongside the current Shadow Minister for Finance, Jim Chalmers, who may well have a new job. And broadcaster and commentator Alan Jones. He's been a major player in the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government's What Role Will He Play for the Next Three Years? Till next Monday's post-election Q&A, good night.